And the coronavirus pandemic has magnified Africa's structural weaknesses, which make self-isolation and lockdown measures costly and hard to implement. About 60% of the world's poorest people live in Africa, and the majority of the workforce is informal. Limiting the contagion and ensuring proper treatment of affected patients is of primary importance to the continent. No doubt, the continent has drawn from the muscle uh, memory of previous epidemics and has mounted a response from which others can learn. The UN and the African Union are coming together to overcome this challenge. The UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has called on G20 leaders to adopt a stimulus package for developing countries. A humanitarian appeal for uh, United States uh, dollars, $2 billion, has been launched. An African anti-COVID-19 fund has been established by the Bureau of the Assembly of the African Union Heads of State and Government. The UN has also launched a policy brief on the impact of COVID-19 on Africa, saying the world could learn lessons from Africa's preventive measures to stop the spread of the virus. As COVID-19 spreads across the continent, Africa has responded swiftly to the pandemic, and as of now, reported cases are lower than feared. Even so, much hangs in the balance. In recent years, Africans have done much to advance the well-being of the continent's people. Economic growth has been strong, the digital revolution has taken hold, a free trade area has been agreed. But the pandemic threatens African progress. It will aggravate long-standing inequalities and heighten hunger, malnutrition and vulnerability to disease. Already, demand for Africa's commodities, tourism and remittances are declining. The opening of the trade zone has been pushed back and millions could be pushed into extreme poverty. The virus has taken more than 2,500 African lives. Vigilance and preparedness are critical. I commend what African countries have done already together with the African Union. Most have moved rapidly to deepen regional coordination, deploy health workers and enforce quarantines, lockdowns and border closures. They are also drawing on the experience of HIV AIDS and Ebola to debunk rumours and overcome mistrust of governments, security forces and health workers. I express my total solidarity with the people and governments of Africa in tackling COVID-19. United Nations agencies, country teams, peacekeeping operations and humanitarian workers are providing support. UN Solidarity Flights have delivered millions of test kits, respirators and other supplies, reaching almost the entire continent. The policy brief we are issuing today highlights a spectrum of urgent challenges. We are calling for international action to strengthen Africa's health systems, maintain food supplies, avoid the financial crisis, support education, protect jobs, keep households and businesses afloat, and cash on the continent against lost income and export earnings. African countries should also have quick, equal and affordable access to any eventual vaccine and treatment that must be considered global public goods. I have been calling for a global response package amounting to at least 10% of the world's gross domestic product. For Africa, that means more than 200 US dollar billion as additional support from the international community. I also continue to advocate a comprehensive debt framework, starting with an across-the-board debt standstill for countries unable to service their debt, followed by targeted debt relief and a comprehensive approach to structural issues in the international debt architecture to prevent default. Okay, well, for more on Africa's COVID-19 response, I have now been joined from Ethiopia via WebEx by the Director General, Africa Center for Disease Control, Dr. John Nkengasong, the Cameroonian-born virologist and HIV specialist. Thanks so very much, uh, John, for joining us from far away Addis Ababa. But you want to tell us, I mean, um, what kind of support has the Africa Center for Disease Control uh, really been uh, given uh, the continent uh, since the outbreak of the COVID-19 uh, virus? 
Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on your program. Uh, it's an honor to, to discuss COVID-19 the, at the continental level. Uh, you remember that once uh, the first case of COVID-19 was reported on the continent, uh, precisely in Egypt, the African Union Commission exercised uh, considerable leadership under the chairpersonship of uh, His Excellency Musa Faki and convened a meeting of all ministers of health uh, in Addis Ababa, and the Minister of Health of Nigeria was in attendance then. That was a strong recognition that the continent as a whole uh, recognized that uh, this was a serious threat, a threat that had multi dimensions to it, and that we we're taking it extremely seriously. So, at the political level, the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has leveraged uh, the, the highest leadership of the continent to mobilize ourselves and apply ourselves accordingly to respond to this deadly virus. Secondly, at the technical level, we have established a coordinating task force called the African Task Force for Coronavirus Response and Preparedness, which, of course, Nigeria is part of that, and the WHO as well. So we do coordinate activities at the technical level in five major areas, including surveillance, laboratory, uh, enhanced airport screening, as well as risk communication and then research and, and, and science. So those are the areas that the Africa CDC has been supporting member states in coordination, of course, with the World Health Organization. Fantastic to know, uh, John. But uh, let me ask you, no doubt you must be faced with uh, quite a number of challenges. And uh, good to know again that uh, the WHO is uh, collaborating with the center. But were you part of uh, the alarming figures given by the WHO when it said between 300,000 to about 3 million Africans are at the risk of, you know, uh, dying from the COVID-19 virus? Do you share uh, that figure by the WHO? So uh, I think that, that that's a very good question. Uh, we should examine where we are as a continent today. Uh, as a continent of 55 member states, we've reported, as we speak, over 100,000 cases of COVID-19. And this is a new threshold we've crossed today with over uh, 3,000 deaths, a little bit over uh, 3,000 deaths. I mean, this shows clearly that our uh, infection or pandemic is still on, on the rising side there. I think we have to take this very, very seriously. So we, as the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, uh, uh, of course, recognize that modeling is very important to understand the trajectory of this pandemic. We also recognize that we should pay attention to mitigating and trying to blunt this, this pandemic using three strategies. One is to make sure we increase our testing. Secondly, that we trace people who are infected, isolate them. And thirdly, that we treat, we provide a treatment, that is care for those who are in, in infected them. We believe that we cannot treat ourselves out of this pandemic, but we can test ourselves out of this pandemic if we do the right things there. So uh, modeling in Africa is challenging because you need to have accurate data, which we are still struggling with. The strategy that the continent elaborated on February 25th, uh, sorry, February 22nd, hinges on the ability to coordinate, to cooperate, to coordinate, and to communicate. So the more we have information from member states, the more it will empower us to come out with appropriate predictions and projections that will be meaningful for our continent. But for now, we are focusing on making sure that we contain this outbreak uh, as quickly as, as possible. Containing the outbreak as quickly as possible. Yours is uh, a center for disease control. But what other collaborative efforts have you been having from pharmaceutical companies, uh, particularly herbal uh, products uh, for the treatment or management of COVID-19 virus. We know that Madagascar uh, came up with one called COVID Organics. What kind of collaborative effort do you have with Trado uh, African Herbal Medicine? That's a very good question. Let me, uh, first of all, step back and uh, kind of discuss what the continent is doing as, as a whole. I mean, as we speak, there are 29 clinical trials that are registered that Africa CDC is tracking carefully uh, across the continent. And some of those, of course, in Nigeria, a lot of them in Egypt. 
So the continent is busy and is actively participating in the search for uh, measures to control and prevent this uh, deadly virus then. Now, with respect to Madagascar, we are in very direct discussions with the, the government of Madagascar. We have met with the, the ambassador here in Addis Ababa, and the foreign ministry recently reached out to us uh, expressing their full readiness to cooperate in, um, in for, with us so that we can at least understand what is going on with respect to this um, med uh, remedy. I think I need to be very clear that we uh, know that the solution, uh, the, the, the medical solution against COVID-19 will come from anywhere. I think we, we approach that with an open mind. Yeah, Webex uh, from Ethiopia. Now, um, let me allow you conclude that your uh, line of thoughts before we went on break. That's about how you're trying to collaborate with the Madagascan government on the COVID uh, organics that they've produced. Absolutely. I was saying that we have uh, now officially engaged with the government of Madagascar. And uh, just last week, the foreign ministry reached out to us and to express their total uh, support for uh, us to work together to understand what is going on. I think we are looking at two things there. One, we want to review the existing data that enable them to uh, uh, make a declaration that they have such uh, a remedy. And then secondly, to examine if there are gaps that needs to be filled and we work collaboratively with them to ensure that we conduct a, a proper um, evaluation or clinical trial. So again, without seeing the data on safety and efficacy, it's uh, difficult for us to make any pronouncement at this point. But we remain extremely open to collaborate with the government of Madagascar. A good request from the African continent about uh, using uh, herbal, uh, traditional herbal uh, medicines for the management of COVID-19, but none uh, has been certified yet uh, by uh, maybe the World Health Organization and uh, organizations like yours. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct. And again, I, I want to be very clear that we are not by saying that we have not validated that, uh, expressing any doubts that uh, the traditional medicine can play a critical role in this. We are extremely open to any solution. We don't know where the solution will come from, but we insist on two things, that there should be evidence that it is safe for the, uh, the patient, and then secondly, that it's effective, or what we call efficacious against COVID-19. Very well. Open to all solutions uh, to finding, you know, um, uh, the cure or management of the COVID-19. But there are loads of gaps, even from your own testing kits that you've been able to uh, distribute, just about 13,000 short of the 1 million target. And when you look at uh, highly populated countries like Nigeria with about 200 million people, you'll find that that is uh, highly insignificant. What other steps, I mean, what other support are you getting from world bodies, you know, to speed up uh, the testing issue? That's why some analysts, some health experts say that uh, the curve is though slowly climbing because the testing is very minute that is going on in the continent. You, you are absolutely right. We have a challenge as a continent that we are not uh, testing enough. And that is not because the continent doesn't know how to test. We know that uh, Africa is used to testing massively. We are used to testing a lot of, uh, doing a lot of HIV tests, tuberculosis tests, and malaria tests. But we do not manufacture tests on the continent. We have to rely on externalities to uh, fuel our supply chain management for, for testing kits uh, and, and the tests and reagents and accessories that come, come with that. So I think we have to always recognize that, that if you take a country like Nigeria, you should be able to uh, test about 2 million people. That is 1% of your population in order to uh, meet the appropriate re requirements there. But as we speak today, I think Nigeria has tested about 40,000 people. But that is significantly up from just where we were one month ago. Just one month ago, to be specific, on the 26th of April, the testing number in Nigeria was around 10,000. And so the more you test, the more you find. And they, as the Nigeria strategy, well re elaborated by the Nigeria CDC expresses, you have to be able to uh, test people, isolate them, 
uh, rapidly and then treat them. That strategy aligns squarely with what the Africa CDC is promoting, which is the, the PAC initiative, the partnership to accelerate COVID testing. And we are very determined uh, to continue to work with partners to increase that number of tests to about 10 million in the next uh, two to three months. And we are working with several parties and, and exploring all markets, including the European, working closely with the World Health Organization, working with the, the US markets and working with the Chinese markets to unlock the supply chain management system for diagnostics. As we speak, we have just shipped 60,000 additional tests to Nigeria, which should be arriving either today or in course of uh, the next few days there to support their testing ability. I must say on this that we are extremely pleased with the leadership role that the Nigeria CDC has, uh, has played. And that is a relatively new organization, but it's boring from its experience from fighting Lazar fever and other outbreaks over the past couple of years to actually applying that to fighting this extremely difficult virus there. I think, uh, as you know, the numbers in Nigeria continue to increase, but the more you test, the more you find new cases there. And the most important thing is to be able to track these cases, isolate them, and continue to uh, uh, put those who are infected under appropriate care. Very well said, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Nkengasong. And Senegal came up with a novel testing kit that it uh, had used maybe for tuberculosis, just like you said, and uh, HIV, AIDS, and the rest. And that is what they've been using uh, to test uh, their own citizens and getting results. Will the Africa CDC be recommending such a kit? Are you uh, collaborating with Senegal on that? Uh, we, we are collaborating with Senegal very closely on multiple fronts. I think Senegal was um, actually one of those uh, countries, and to, uh, to be very specific, the Institute Pasteur in Senegal was the platform that we used very early on in February to train many countries. There, I think, again, I, I'm, we are truly appreciative of uh, Senegal's ability to open its facilities for uh, the CDC uh, to use to train many countries. There. Now, uh, the, the, the platform you are referring to is, is, is not new and for, to Senegal. It's a platform that is used actually across Nigeria and other countries to test for tuberculosis. What is new is that they've added a new uh, a cartridge, a new device to it, which you can use specifically to test for COVID-19. And we are working very closely with the manufacturers to make sure that we have access to those uh, devices as quickly as possible and ship them to, to many countries there. That will help us decentralize testing because it doesn't require that we transport specimens and it will provide for early turnaround time for the specimens to be, uh, for the test results to be used in managing the patients. there. So uh, what Senegal is doing is, is great, but we want to see that scale up across uh, Africa as a continent. Great. In just one minute, in your earlier answer, you had talked about, you know, increasing the testing capability of the African countries uh, in the next two to three months. It presupposes that COVID-19 is not going to go away very soon. Quickly, before we go on break. Uh, you're absolutely right. We should prepare ourselves for, for a marathon, not a spring. We, we will... Uh, be uh, living with COVID-19 for uh, for a while. I think it's a very dangerous virus. It's spreading very quickly, and we are very early on in our pandemic. In, uh, the, the, a lot of uh, Africans uh, don't seem to believe so much that uh, what they describe as flu, Qatar, cough, you know, uh, normal colds, particularly when you have, you know, a change of weather. Uh, in the continent, maybe Nigeria, for example, is moving from the dry season to the wet season or rainy season, which is the time for planting and the rest. And they just feel that, oh, it's all about malaria, cough and cold, and uh, we can treat it with the, the usual uh, dogoyaro herbs and the rest. What are your thoughts here? Uh, no, my, my thoughts are that we, uh, as a continent, we have to take this virus very seriously. We have seen that um, countries that have uh, neglected or underestimated this virus have paid a big price. I think, again, uh, absolute caution that we cannot be complacent. Uh, we are early on in, in a pandemic, and once the virus seeds itself into a community, it has the tendency to 
to actually expand quickly and then you begin to see disastrous consequences there. So we have to prepare ourselves for the long haul. And lastly, just to say that this is a community effort. We have to use the community. Everybody has to cooperate and work with the government, work with Nigeria's CDC, work with the Ministry of Health, uh -huh. and actually use the whole of a All government right. approach.